missing uh, your keys, and I'm missing my, I got them in my head, my glasses. We are going to be uh, looking at two uh, different scriptures this evening. Uh, one is from the Old Testament, the other one is from the New Testament. Uh, and uh, the idea is to somehow uh, make a connection between the two. Uh, scriptures uh, concerning uh, what I call uh, food for the soul. So hopefully you are hungry this evening. Um, and hopefully uh, we can all leave with uh, our spirits uh, comforted as we uh, look at these passages. Uh, the first passage we're going to look at is Isaiah 40. The book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 40 and we're going to be uh, looking at it reading some of it before we do that let me tell you something about the prophets uh, you know every time when we read the prophets in the Old Testament when God will send the prophet it's because something was not going right Something was going on. Some people have called the prophets God's covenant lawyers. They're the ones who were sent as God's lawyers to enforce because they have broken the covenant. And if you look at the language they use, it's all about they use the prophets use the law to bring to bear about what was going on with the people. So usually we tend to look at the prophets as just a, you know, a bunch of cranky guys uh, nobody likes. But uh, you never see God sending a prophet to say, that saith the Lord, you guys are doing great. You, you hardly see any prophet come in and say, God sent me to congratulate you for being so faithful. Usually when a prophet gets there, it's because something's coming. And uh, he is there to enforce on God's behalf or uh, to represent God and his uh, covenant. But even though they speak a lot about judgment, they also always call the people to repent. And they plead with people. This is God speaking through the prophets, pleading, uh, repent, and, and, and God will forgive you. Turn from your sin, and God will uh, forgive your sins. It's, it's always, and so, in, 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 in the prophet Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, you got 39 chapters of judgment and this, judgment and that. Uh, and so it's all... Gloom and gloom. But finally, finally in chapter 40, he comes the comfort. Because God is uh, a God of mercy and grace. And so, you know, after 39 uh, of just judgment and judgment and judgment, finally in chapter 40, we get to there and says, comfort, comfort my people. So this is a word of comfort to the people of God. See? Uh, it's not all bad in judgment. He says, comfort my people as well. Uh, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. That her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so uh, verse 6 says, a voice says, cry. And I said, why shall I cry? What's the message? What do you want me to tell them? Well, all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass wither, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. When the... Um, it says, the grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. 
So the message from God to his people is a message of comfort. And God said, the time of punishment, the time of warfare is over. There is a time that is coming of comfort. Now, this is a message of hope. Because what do you tell people when they have going through all kinds of sufferings, all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of uh, hurt and pain? And he said, what can you tell them to comfort them? What can give them hope? Uh, And so the message that God has for his people through Isaiah is, listen, listen. Your time is over. There is a bright future ahead, he's saying the prophet. Uh, You have already been punished enough, says God. And now it's time of restoration. Now, by the time this message got there, and I say I was preaching this message to the people of God, the, the ten northern tribes have been taken away in exile okay and nation after nation have come and just pound on Israel just you know uh, sack them and and, and, and defeat them and and, and do all kinds of things to them and Isaiah is prophesying a message of comfort that there will be an end to this there will be an end to this, but as you keep on reading, and I said, this is, this is, Babylon hasn't even got there yet. Babylon has not really, hasn't made it to the walls of Jerusalem yet, yet the message of hope and comfort got there before, ahead of time. So the idea is that we have to believe this, we have to take it by faith. The message of comfort that there will be a better future is always got to be taken by faith. It's always have to believe it, even if the situation right now doesn't appear to be so. And so that's the the comfort. And, And the reason and the way that he gives is, listen, take comfort in this. Nothing lasts forever. And that's what uh, Isaiah, through the message, is saying, listen to me, all flesh is like grass. So he wants to end the message, is saying, nothing lasts forever. Even though it seems like man has got the upper hand. Even though we're still going to, you are going to, Taken in, you're going to be taken into exile. Now, he's speaking about a message of comfort and a better hope, and yet Babylon is about to come and destroy the whole place. It's about to come and take them as exiles for a whole lifetime. Nevertheless, God saying, it won't last forever. There is a bright future. Even though it doesn't look like it right now, he says, I want you to comfort. And you know, when, when you read the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, God told the prophet Jeremiah, listen, when you are in exile, make sure that you live by faith over there. Because the message of comfort remains. And even though you are in exile, I want you to find comfort And the promise that nothing lasts forever. Especially those who are your enemies. And so that's why God gives uh, the prophet Isaiah this message. It says, comfort my people. Comfort. Because when you find yourself in exile, the only thing that you can find comfort in is God's promises. God's word is that that will comfort you. And so, that is food 
for the soul. You know, when I was a, an inexperienced father, you know, when we had our first uh, uh, jubilee, when we had our first jubilee, I, I, I didn't know much about fatherhood and like that, you know, the, because the, I didn't know much. But I remember when she was a baby, and uh, uh, she would have like a little accident or something like that. She'd start crying. And uh, I, I noticed that Nicole will pick her up and, you know, uh, immediately bring her to feed, you know. And, and, and I start noticing that. Well, wait a minute. Every time she cried, you feed her. You give her food. I don't know about that. And, uh, of course, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. And she said, she said, that's her comfort. That's how a baby comfort herself with food, with being attached. And so we, as Christians, we need food to comfort us. And, 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 and the more we eat the, the Word of God, the more comfort we'll find when we find ourselves let's say it in exile, when we find ourselves surrounded by enemies. And so God says, tell my people, make sure to tell them, he says, uh, all flesh is grass. Now, why would he say that? And all its beauty is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fades. Now, pay attention to the words over there that says, withers and fades. So what God is saying, this is not last forever. Man and his power can rise up really high. But guess what? They always come to an end because all flesh has an end. So he's saying, eventually, I'm going to put an end to your enemies. I'm going to put an end to all of this. Take comfort in that. He says, now, it's got a language of salvation. He said, uh, get up uh, in verse 9. Get you up to high mountains of Zion, heralds of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O oh, Jerusalem, heralds of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. So what you see the language over here, it says there is salvation coming. There is a reward. You see the language. It says, God, there will be a time of salvation. There will be a time of reward. I will come with recompense, he says. Okay? Tell my people that. Not Everything is punishment and difficulty and pain and suffering. No, there will be a time, he says, when I will come and tend to my flock. There will be time when I will gather my lambs. You see, there's that language of uh, all this pain and suffering is going to end. Okay? And he says, I will bring with me a reward and recompense. It's not everything punishment. It's not everything pain. Even though it seems like it lasts for a long time, even though it seems like the enemy is just one leave and the other one comes, come for my people, he says to the prophet, and tell them that the good times are coming as well. You see, we have to find comfort in that. And they have not even yet been in exile. They will be exiled. But isn't it good to go prepare? And then you... you uh, you read uh, the book of uh, Daniel, and you see how he took this message, and he lived by faith faithfully while he was in exile. And sure enough, the exile was ended. And, and, and by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the exile ended, and they came back and rebuilt. So it is, uh, God says, nothing lasts forever, and and it seems like man has the upper hand. He says, take comfort in this. Sooner or later, they will wither and fade away. And I will come with my reward and recompense, he says. Now, the only thing that stands forever is the word of God. 
So let's take comfort in God's promises that he will come with salvation. He will come with reward. He will come with recompense. Okay, so now let's go to uh, 1 Peter, which is our next... Uh, which is our next uh, text that we're going to look at. And remember, the Apostle Peter was uh, commissioned by God. In John 21, remember, Jesus went and looked for Peter, and he says, Peter, I need you to feed my sheep. And this is the language of food. He's always talking about food. Uh, but this is food for the soul. Food of comfort. And so Jesus went and told Peter, I need you to feed my lambs. I need you to feed my sheep. And so Peter got on down with the pen and start feeding us. So this is food for our souls. Uh, and so it's very important for us to... Uh, Trust and believe in this. Now, in the times of Peter, it's the same deal. What, how, oh, what can you comfort people with when this guy named Nero is just killing Christians right and left? What, how can you comfort someone who has been persecuted for being good, for being a Christian? How can you comfort somebody that uh, it's on the run, that has lost everything, and uh, it's suffering in many ways. How would you comfort such a person like that? Uh, what can you tell somebody that is trying to just simply give up the faith and give up the whole Christian stuff and uh, simply quit? I mean, what, what, how can you comfort such a person? Well, Peter does a great job of comforting his people at his time because you're talking about the main emphasis of the, the first epistle of Peter is suffering. Uh, uh, suffering and, and what he does is he called us to endure even though they're suffering. He called us to be holy in the midst of suffering. See, uh, you can tell people, you know, it's going to be okay. But that's another thing to say, hey, remain faithful in the midst of suffering. That's another different deal. How can you do that? Only with the word and promises of God. Because that's the only way we'll find comfort. And our faith is going to be strength in the word of God. And so he begins to write to his people. And like I said, Jesus said, well, you got to feed my sheep. You got to feed my sheep so they uh, can take comfort in a situation. Well, how can you comfort them? Well, first of all, the Apostle Peter opened up his letter uh, saying to the elect. So the first thing that Peter wants them to know is they have been elected. You know, maybe, maybe you don't feel that God elected you because of what you're going through, because of the circumstances, because of the situation. You don't feel like I got elect in that moment. Uh, now, why? Because he says the elected exiles. See, uh, Peter is, address is addressing them as elected. And make sure God has elected you guys, even though you are in exile right now. And you know, the uh, Peter and his people know a thing or two about being exiled. You know, being exiled is not fun. It's, they take you out of your land, out of your house, out of your family, out of your culture, out of your God. I mean, technically you are, you now they own you, okay? You're exiled, you're, you're away, you have basically no rights. Okay, uh, uh, being in exile is no fun at all. And so Peter said, okay, it's not fun right now to be a Christian. And it doesn't feel like being a chosen by God. It sounds good, right? Chosen by God. But he says, 
Okay, I'm going to write to you guys, but I want to make sure to you to know that you have been chosen by God. I know you don't feel like it right now because of things that are going on, but trust me, he says, to uh, those who are elected exiles. So he tells them who they are. They are elected and where they are. You are exiled. So of the dis- uh, he says, you, you, you were exiled everywhere. And the way you were elected is by the foreknowledge of God the Father, in verse 2, and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ for the sprinkling with His blood. He's saying if the whole Trinity is involved in your election and your salvation and in your sanctification. God is involved in all of that. He has elected you. So he says, and then the second thing he, wants, he, he does is a praise. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a praise. So he opened up the letter to give these people comfort with the praise. He says, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So God... He says, God has chosen you, and he has given us a new birth. You have been born again by God's mercy. And then he tells them why. Oh, because he has a purpose. What's the purpose? The purpose, he says, to an inheritance. All right, so Peter is trying to comfort these people. And the first thing he said is, Okay, you've been chosen. And as you were chosen, that means that you have been born again. Okay? Being born again means that why did God uh, give you a new birth? Because his purpose is to give you a new inheritance. That's the purpose. And boy, we can come for people, you know, when we expect a, an inheritance, you know, uh, that's what, we, that's what we wait for. Uh, so he says, what's the purpose of being, of, of salvation? An inheritance. But where's the inheritance? We are in exile. Where is our inheritance if we are in exile? Well, Peter says, and uh, he first described this uh, inheritance. This inheritance is imperishable. It's undefiled. And not fade away. Oh man, you hear that inheritance that you and I have? We have to take comfort in that. He says, This inheritance from, for which God saved us for is an inheritance that is imperishable. What does that mean? It means it's not material. We can't see any of that with our eyes. Say, I don't care how much gold you see. Our inheritance is much worse than that. You know what? Because gold, it perishes. So what Peter is saying, our inheritance, you can't put a price on that. That's the purpose God saved us for. To give us something so valuable that it will last forever. That's what imperishable means. It will last for all eternity. And not only that, he says, I'm defiled. Well, there's nothing in this world that has not been defiled. There's nothing in this world that has not. That's why, you know, human beings and the world, they're all going to be brand new. Because they're all being defiled by sin. But he says, our inheritance is not... Only is going to last forever is undefiled. It's never going to get ruined. It's never going to go to waste. It's something that we'll hold for all eternity. Oh, man. Can we take comfort in that? Even, you see, you know what our problem is? That the uh, temporal gets on our way. And we only see the things that are perishable. The things that are defiled. 
And we put more value in that than our inheritance in heaven. And therefore, we find ourselves losing sleep because of what's here instead of having our eyes on what is there for us. And, and, and we can't even put in the same scale our inheritance up there with whatever we can amount and achieve down here. We cannot. He says, unperishable, undefiled, and will never lose its shine. It will never fade away. See, that's comfort. That's comfort. We, we, we see the world is deteriorating. And we see the world values these things and these things and these things. And it, it is a temptation real for us to take our eyes off our inheritance and put it down here with the material stuff. But I believe one of the biggest, uh, the biggest, I'll say, temptation is the materialism down here. Because we have to see, the thing is, we have to see our inheritance with eyes of faith. We have to see it. Now, now when, it, when it comes to faith, even though we don't see it, we believe it, right? And uh, now let me, let me give you a practical definition of what faith is. Okay? This is very practical. Probably you never heard it before. And if it, you don't agree with it, um, we can talk later. But faith is, look. Acting like it is so, even if it's not so, in order that may be so, simply because God says so. That's faith. And it's more, I mean, natural state. Faith is acting like it is so, even if it's not so, in order that may be so, simply because God says so. That's faith. That's faith. So Peter is trying to comfort his people saying, listen, you have been chosen before the foundation of the world. So you are, I mean, you were chosen. Don't worry about losing, you know, uh, about being elected. Because he did that before the foundation of the world. He did that. So that's secure. Not only you were chosen, you were chosen for a purpose to give you an inheritance. And he said, let me describe this inheritance for you. It's precious. Invaluable. You can put a, a price on it. And you know, um, and he was going to quote the same verses I say I quote. So he says, okay. So salvation to a living hope. And he says, the purpose is that we may have an inheritance and he says, but where is this inheritance? Because we're down here right now. We're exiled. When he said exile means you are not where you're supposed to be. Okay? That's, that's what it means for you and I. Uh, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. So that, that makes us what? Exiles. And he says, okay, you have this great inheritance, but this thing is in heaven your inheritance is in heaven it's not down here and, and but he says so the place where the inheritance is is in heaven and he says he has it reserved for you it's got your name on it nobody's gonna take it away he says he says look he says uh, this inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading he says, kept in heaven for you. It's got your name on it. So there is no one that can take it from you. Why? Because it's in the stored in heaven. All right? And he says, and it's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through the faith for salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. So he's saying we have this inheritance as super valuable, but it is in heaven. We have to wait until we get there to receive it. 
to receive it. And he says, it's reserved for you. And not only that, he says, God is all, not only have it for you and no one can take it, but he's also protecting you to make sure you get there to your inheritance. He says, God, see, he kept this in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And he says, but this inheritance is in heaven and God is going to make sure you get there, but it's in his time, not in your time. See what he said? It's going to be revealed in the last time. When God says it's time for you to go and get your inheritance, that's when you receive it. Meanwhile, we must believe by faith, knowing that our, our inheritance is there. And God is going to make sure that we get there too. See, not only he's giving us the inheritance, he's protecting us and making sure we get there. Boy, that's comfort. That is comfort to a people who's suffering, who's exiled, who's not where they need to be. You know, oh, I wish I could be with my inheritance right now. I would rather be with my inheritance now. But guess what? It's not when I decided, he says, when it's going to be revealed in the last time. So it's all working with God's time, not you and I. You know, and we get impatient sometimes. And we wish things were different. And, and I know we always say, oh, come, Lord. But I don't know. Sometimes like, no, not yet, Lord. Not yet. I know we want to receive that inheritance. You know, when, when you're about to inherit something, you can't wait. Right? But uh, there is nothing you can do to speed the process. Unless the one who's going to give you the inheritance is ready, you can receive it. And by being impatient, you can get nowhere either. So he says, the purpose of God to give us salvation is to give us an inheritance. And guess what? There is nothing more valuable than that. And so he says, God is going to make sure you get there. It's got your name on. Okay? And, uh, but it's in his time. He's it's got you. And so he will make sure. Now, now we go to how do we react to that? How do the people react to this? He says, in this you rejoice. Huh? So we have to be jumping of happiness because not only we've been chosen. Not only we've been chosen to be given an inheritance that we didn't deserve. We didn't work for it. We de couldn't buy it, and it's simply a gift, and it's something that has no price, okay? It's being secure in heaven, and he's going to make sure we get to it. How do we react to that? We rejoice. I know the tough times right now. I know, there's diff I know you were in exile. I know you wish you'd be in a different situation than what you are right now. But he says, no, rejoice in that. That you have this. That you are this. And they will come to this. See, that's comfort. That's food for the soul to comfort us. Because I know the times are difficult. Uh, but let's not let the times get on the way of our spiritual eyes. And we got to live, you know, some, some other uh, verse that says, put your eyes on the things above. Or make treasures in heaven. Things like that. But see, if the city, our exile and situations get on the way, when you have the tendency to despair, look at these promises. Look at the inheritance. First of all, you got to, you got to understand what being chosen means and all that that implies. You have to understand that what you inherited is. And that, when you realize that, then all the things that shine down here for you is going to start losing the shine. Because our inheritance over there is supposed to 
outshine everything down here. See, and so he says, what do we do then? We rejoice. I know the pain is real. Yeah, I know that you're going through a lot. But of the thought that, uh, that who you are and what you have, what can you do? Rejoice. And remember, uh, this Peter is not the first one to tell us all that. Uh, remember, James says, well, when you find yourself being tested and all that, what do we do? Rejoice. Rejoice. Okay, so he says, what should be our attitude then as we find all these truths? Well, we ought to rejoice. Now, but he comes back to reality again. Because he says, and this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So you got in the same text, in the same verse, you got rejoice and grieve. He says, I'm not telling you to deny suffering. I'm not telling you to ignore it because it's real. Okay? He says, even though for a little while. Now when we speak about, when he speaks about this, when we speak about the, the, the time in the Bible, he's saying... Compared to eternity, okay, your grieving is just for a little while. And see, we always got to measure things up in that way. Always the eternal with the temporal. When it comes to timing, we always got to say that because if you compare eternity with time, okay, time will just seem a little while when you compare it to eternity. Or as Peter will say in chapter in, 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 in the second letter, he says, "Remember, uh, to the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day." So he says, "We have to do the same when it comes to grief and suffering. We have to first thing we got to do is this is only for a little while, comparing to the eternity, comparing to." Uh, the inheritance. This is only a short time. Right? And, and so you'll, you remember the exile didn't last forever. It was only a period of time. And then came the salvation. You know, uh, 400 years of slavery. But guess what? It ended. It was not forever. There was a time of exodus to a promised land full with milk and honey. And so he says, uh, we got all this, and we are all this, even though for a little while, while we're here on earth, while we are in exile, okay? You might have to go to some grieving, okay? And remember, the Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, he says, the suffering of this life cannot even be compared. To the blessings that we're going to receive up there. And so we have to understand we're going to grieve. That's for sure. The apostle says for a little while. Remember we're in exile. And it's no fun in exile. Right? But nevertheless it's not going to last forever. It's just if we look at it with eyes of faith. It's only a little while. See. Only a little while compare to the eternity that we're going to have. So that's comfort. That's comfort. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. And that's uh, the message that he's trying to get across. He says, okay, so what's the source of our grieving? Because he tells us. Okay, what is it that makes you grieve? And, and, we, and remember, he's, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people that have been chosen to have faith. He says, and this would you, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if it's necessary, you have been grieving by various trials, so that, what's the purpose of the trial? Well, so that the test, so that the tested genuineness, genuine, how do you say that word? Huh? Okay, uh, uh, he says, well, the trial test had genuine 
is your faith. That's what he's saying. Remember, what will protect us and get us there is what? Faith. Exactly. To our salvation. And so, what does God do then is to send trials to us to make sure. Remember, he's going to make sure we get to our inheritance. Okay? It's in heaven. He's going to make sure we get there. And the way he's going to make sure we get there is by faith. But only genuine faith will get us there. And the only way to find out if our faith is genuine is by trials. And trials. And what the trials do is they grieve us. But there's the only way. You don't want to get to the end. And get all ready to get your inheritance. And all of a sudden find out that your faith was not genuine. Can you imagine? Huh? Can you imagine be like one of those that uh, waited all the way until the end. And there's, you know, in Matthew, Jesus is over here sitting in the throne. And they're like, okay, Lord, we're ready. And, and Jesus is like, who are you? I don't know you. Wait a minute, but, 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 but. No. So, let me tell you something. Uh, grief, called trials are necessary. If we do not welcome them, we will never know if our faith is genuine or not. Therefore, our inheritance, we don't know if we're going to get there or not. So he says, okay, listen to me. You are chosen. Okay? Get that. The purpose is for God to give you an inheritance. But the inheritance is in heaven. And you can only get there by faith. But the faith needs to be... Because, you know, there is that kind of faith that the demon has. That it won't, it won't work for nothing. Just to have your head full of knowledge of who Jesus is... It's not genuine faith. Okay? So you can name the name of Jesus, use whatever you want to do. But how you respond in trials is what tells you if your faith is the real deal. And so Peter has said, it's, it, it, we can't get away from that. Just like a, I was talking to Scotty, he's... Uh, he went to the same place I went to get that car from IS, um, whatever that is. But, I mean, we spent all day, you know, going through all the stuff. And, and the instructor, one of the instructors says, he show us a picture of a big fire, you know, in one of the refineries. He says, you know what? Uh, I told you all these things about safety, set, but you can never get away from that. He says, that always going to happen. <laughs> and so what Peter is saying is, the fire of the trials is coming. And we need it, he says, because that is going to put us in the right track on the way to the inheritance. So if we don't welcome the trials, if we always run away, if we always find a way out and don't want to deal with it, guess what? Then uh, you are in danger of maybe... Uh, your faith is not genuine. So he says, okay, for a little while you might be grieved. Don't, I mean, don't focus so much on the grieving process. Focus in your inheritance for all eternity. And he says, uh, God does this so that he tests the genuineness, genuine, okay. genuineness of your faith. I got Juby here to help me, but she, she forgot. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, he says, so that uh, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, guess what he's going to be looking for when he comes? Genuine faith. Genuine faith. And so he says, though you have not seen him, you love him, though you do not know, see him. Huh? Loved him. Yeah, loved him. You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is expressed and filled with glory, 
Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, he's saying then, uh, all this has got to be done by faith. By faith, even though we don't see it right now. Even though we're in exile. Even though the pain is uh, it's necessary. You know, I remember one time I was working with a guy and and there's this guy that came with the speaking about testing gold by by fire he came with this uh gold chain you know and he's like hey man i, I gotta sell this and uh, you know i'll give it to you a good price and and uh, you know he he took it off this is real gold and what he did was he grabbed it and he scratched it on the concrete you know and he's scratching and scratching and, and he showed it to him and he, he looked like the real deal. <laughs> and my friend's like, yeah, of course. You know, he bought it. Uh, then he, he put it on and he was taking a shower. And stay, oh, this was dark, you know, black. <laughs> he, he was deceived. He thought, well, that's not the real test for gold. Only fire will reveal what real gold is. Well, only fire will reveal the fire of trials will reveal what good faith is. And so, if you are going to a grieving process because of a trial, that's God making sure you make it to the inheritance. Don't complain. What did he say that our attitude should be? Rejoice. We rejoice. Because God is doing a good thing. Is a, is doing a good thing. Or as James said, and he will say, don't be surprised when you encounter uh, the fire of trials. Peter will say, farther ahead, I think it's in, in, uh, in verse 2 or 3. I, I, I forgot what it is, but he also said, well, don't be surprised. If you're chosen, and if you got an inheritance with your name on, well, don't be surprised when the trial comes. And what he's telling them is, well, you already know what's going on. But what do we do so many times? We're trying to get out of the, of the test. See? We're trying to get out. And if we don't do that, we start blaming God. And if we don't do that, huh, we start to complain. And we think it's the neighbor. We think it's the wife. We think it's the kids. We think it's the church. We think it's the government. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's God making sure to test your faith so you will not miss on your inheritance. Because the greatest tragedy will be to think you got this and at the end find out that your faith was not genuine. Boy, if you look at the at the life of the Israelites. That's why God took them to the desert. He says, I took you, I could have took you straight up three days, no problem. But guess what? I let you be thirsty and hungry to see what was in your heart. He's got this, listen. While they were being grieved in Egypt, in Canaan, all these guys were building farms and houses and wells and plantations and cities. God was building all of that for them. Okay? They're being grieved in Egypt. Okay? But remember, Joseph has said, listen, God will come and take you out. That's the promise. I know you're in exile and I know you're suffering, but guess what? It's not going to last forever. God will visit you. And bring you to a land that flows with milk and honey. All right, so the land is ready. I mean, wells that you did not dig, houses you not build. I mean, whole entire communities. God's got all these inheritance for them. And guess what? For a little bit of water and food, they lost it all. Because as soon as the first trial came, they began to complain. Now, when they get out of Egypt, they say, yeah, 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 we believe in God. Oh, yeah, we have faith in God. And hallelujah and glory to God and all that. When they're in the desert, what do they do? God, you don't love us. You brought us out of there to kill us. See, blaming God 
and complaining and this and that. You know what they did? God says, you are not receiving your inheritance. You dying in the desert. Because uh, a little bit of trial and we start crying like babies. But Peter is comforting the people. You're chosen. You in exile. The grief is real. But guess what? It's God's hand behind all this, guys. To preserve you for you to be able to make it all the way to an inheritance that is imperishable. That it won't fade away and is undefiled. Only God can give those things. So let's take comfort in that and trust God uh, for his protection to get us there. Let us not just have faith. Remember what Paul says, Habakkuk said, the just will live by faith. Our problem is not that you only come to Jesus of God for salvation. We have faith enough to go to the cross, but not faith enough to trust in him to get us there. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. So let's trust in him for all the steps. And at the end, we'll take comfort in that. Father, we thank you for your word of comfort. We know that uh, your thoughts are not our thoughts, and your ways are not our ways. But you have revealed in Scripture, Lord, that uh, you are in control. Even when we grieve, you know it all. You know what's going on in our lives. We thank you because in your, in your word we find comfort. Comfort in the midst of suffering. Comfort in the midst of trouble, of pain, of suffering. And uh, sometimes we, we want to be absent from the body and present with you, Lord. But please help us to understand that it's in your time. And it's according to your ways that we'll get there and we'll receive what you have promised to us. So help us to endure. But give us discernment, Lord, to see these things with eyes of faith. And help us to not be distracted by the material world in which we live in that sometimes gets in the way of faith and distract us from our real inheritance, that it will come a time. Strengthen our faith by your word and by the power of the Spirit, that we may rejoice, even though for a little while we may be grieved by different trials in our lives. Help us to hope and endure. For the name of Jesus Christ we prayed. Amen. Thank you very much. You are dismissed. Dismiss, dismiss. I've got to practice my English. Genuineness. Genuineness? Genuineness. Genuine. Genuineness. Just like the tool. Hey, look, there's Nero. Tool. Tool.